Good morning, everyone. My name is Sarah Sewell. I'm a professor of history at Virginia Wesleyan University, and I'm happy to welcome you to this second lecture um, in a series that I'm entitling The Cult of Domesticity in Europe. I hope you are all well and have had, had a safe week. Um, I'm missing you, and I hope to one day see you again in person, but uh, that obviously can't happen right now, so this is my best effort to try to connect with you. Now, last week's lecture, we focused on the cult of domesticity, and I'm going to do a little bit of a review of that, so in case you don't know what that is. And today's topic is romantic love in the 19th century. Next slide, please. So one of the things that I um, said last week is if you have any questions or comments, you can email me. My email address is right up there. It's ssewell at vw.edu. I only got one email, um, so I'm missing you. And so you don't have to have a question or a comment. You can just email me and say hi and tell me how you are doing. So I'd love to hear from you. Again, my email is ssewell at vwu.edu. So let's start with a review from last week. Next slide. Uh, so what I have here is a quotation from the French Revolution. Uh, it was during uh, 1793 when the National Convention was debating women's roles in the political order. And here's what they had to say. Can women devote themselves to these useful and difficult political functions? No, because they would be obliged to sacrifice the more important cares to which nature calls them. The private functions for which women are destined by their very nature are related to the general order of society. This social order results from the differences between man and woman. In other words, um, as the French Revolution took off, democratic rights expanded, they debated whether or not women should be equal participants in the polity or the political order. And as they considered this, they thought about how they perceived women's natures, women's biological nature. And they argued women had a more important function. That important function was derived from the biology, meaning women are to be mothers. And because they were to be mothers, then they should have political actors, at least not political actors equal to that of men. Next slide. So um, when the French Revolution in the 1790s, they made a distinction between uh, what they call active citizens and passive citizens. Essentially, active citizens were men. They had full civil rights and they had full political rights, meaning they could be political actors. Women, however, they categorized as passive citizens, meaning they had full civil rights, so protection under the law, equal protection under the law. However, they were not to be political actors um, as men were to be. And so it's kind of an, an irony of the French Revolution, just at the moment that they are granting more democratic rights to men, they restrict rights for women. And this is sort of new terrain, and it cements women's status for at least the next 100, 150 years. Next slide. So the French Revolution ended with Napoleon Bonaparte becoming the emperor of France. And here you see a very famous painting by Jacques-Louis David of uh, the coronation of Napoleon in 1804. And Napoleon, you know, he is a product of the French Revolution, but in many ways he also is the antithesis of the French Revolution. But one of the things he did is he continued along the French Revolution's line to restrict women's rights. Next slide. So Napoleon very famously issued the Napoleonic Code of 1804. This was a set of laws, over 2,000 laws, that govern many aspects of society. And one of the points that I made to you last week is this uh, Napoleonic Code was implemented in France, but it was also implemented in all of the territories that Napoleon conquered, which was quite a large swath of Europe in the early 19th century, and even in the United States because France um, had owned Louisiana. Can you show the Napoleonic Code slide, please? 
Okay. So, uh, so just so some things about the Napoleonic Code in regards to women. They were even more severely restricted from the public sphere than they had been during the French Revolution. Um, they reaffirmed the patriarchal order, meaning that in the family, men, the husbands, the fathers were in charge. The French Revolution had acted, enacted pretty progressive divorce laws in favor of women. Napoleon overturned those. In terms of property in the family, uh, the Napoleonic Code secured all the property for the men. They had all of the control and women weren't allowed to form contracts or own property. Uh, at the same time, the Napoleonic Code gave fathers extensive rights over their children. And so at the end of the day, what we have is a family policy where women's rights are curtailed, not only outside of the family, but also within, um, within the family. And I will remind you, it's not until 1945 that women in France get the right to vote. And it's not until 1965 that women in the France women in France get equal status to that of their husbands. Next slide, please. All of this was summed up with this quote. There have been many discussions on the equality and superiority of the sexes. Nothing is more useless than thus such disputes. Women need protection because they are weaker. Men are free because they are stronger. And that pretty much sort of summed up people's approach to uh, women's rights and women's roles in the course of the 19th century. Next slide. So switching gears a little, I showed you this slide last time um, to illustrate how before the 19th century, people lived in urban areas. And what you had is a four or five story uh, building. And in that building, all the classes lived together. On the ground floor, usually lived the wealthiest of people. And you can kind of see that in the decorations in, these, in, the, in the house. I remind you that the ground floor is not the, the bottom floor. The bottom floor is the basement where the servants lived. But on the ground floor, um, the middle classes lived. And then as you worked your way up the, uh, up the building, uh, people became poorer and, and poorer. So by the time you get to the top, you have day laborers who have just like maybe a one room, very bare, basic uh, attic space. Uh, and then I, we talked a little bit about industrialization. Industrialization had a lot of benefits um, in terms of manufacturing, but on the bad side, it brought a lot of disease to these urban areas. And as a result, the middle classes left urban areas. Next slide. And they began to move to the suburbs and they built single family homes. Next slide. These family homes needed to be decorated and one of the jobs of women in this cult of domesticity was to decorate their homes with all of the products. And here you can see a parlor from Sweden from about 1890. Next slide. So in these parlor or sitting rooms, this picture illustrates what was the ideal. The man, husband reading peacefully his journal, um, the woman there, she looks like she's knitting or sewing, some kids playing by the fireplace with a cat. And then in the background, you see two uh, older daughters who are playing the piano and probably singing. Next slide. So women were, middle-class women were relegated to the domestic sphere. Um, and to help them to learn how to be good homemakers and this cult of domesticity, there were all kinds of uh, books published, um, advice books to tell them what to do. So can you show the slide, please? So here's just some um, quotations from a very famous book by Elizabeth Poole Sanford from Britain. So here's some of her advice. Domestic life is women's spheres. Domestic comfort is the chief source of her influence and the greatest debt society owes her. For happiness is almost an element of virtue and nothing conduces more to improve the character of men than domestic peace. In other words, the good homemaker created a home where the man came home and he enjoyed domestic peace after a long, hard day of work. Uh, and then she also said, she will be loved, she the mother, wife will be loved in proportion as she makes those around her happy. So her job was to create a very happy, conducive environment for her husband and her children. Next slide, please. 
The most famous of the uh, advice books in Britain was Isabella's Beaton's book of household management. I want you to understand that every middle class woman had this book in her home and read it and took the advice and followed it as a way to participate in this cult of domesticity. So here's some of the advice offered. The modest virgin, the prudent wife, and the careful matron are much more serviceable in life than petticoated philosophers, blustering heroines, or virago queens. In other words, you want to be happy. Your job, woman, wife, is to stay home and take care of your family and be modest and be prudent, not to be out in the public sphere. Um, she also said this, as with the commander of any army or the leader of any enterprise, so is it with the mistress of a house. Her spirit will be seen through the whole establishment. And just in proportion as she performs her duties intelligently and thoroughly, so will her domestics follow her in her path. So she is to have control of the house, organize it, management, let her spirit of happiness shine through. She's to be diligent and intelligent and manage her servants. Virtue is necessary for the proper management of a household. So key to the cult of domesticity is women, middle-class women were to be virtuous and run their household as such. And so one like element of this virtue is when a woman, when a mistress is an early riser, it is almost certain that her house will be orderly and well managed. So get up and take care of your house. Next slide. So um, last week I talked a little bit about sewing and I use this as an example to show you how there was a deliberate attempt to redefine femininity in the 19th century. So previously the idea of a sewing machine was something that was tied to men's occupations. Okay, they, the, the, the sewing machine was a machine and it was believed that women couldn't operate machines. And therefore, it was exclusively the domain of men. But as the sewing machine became mass produced, um, there is a deliberate attempt to sell it to women, particularly middle class women at first. So they had to feminize it. They had to make the sewing machine acceptable to women who believe that, you know, it was only for men. And so what did they do? So one of the things that they did is the actual design of the sewing machine is feminized. It's meant to be sort of pretty. Uh, they place the sewing machine in the parlor and then the advertisers do an awful lot to try to convince men and or women and their husbands that every woman should have a sewing machine in their home. Next slide. With industrialization and this cult of domesticity, uh, the housewives had to fill their homes with all kinds of goods, uh, from furniture to silver sets to clothing to toys for their children. And one of the things that uh, they took pride in was porcelain. And so they had these huge china sets. And here is an illustration of a hot chocolate set from the 19th century. And my key point here is, if you are a middle class woman, um, participating in this cult of domesticity, you are not going to serve coffee or tea in your hot chocolate set. You had to have three different sets for the hot beverages and knowing which one to use and how to use it at which time uh, separated you from other classes who might not have that. So by collecting this china and using this china, this was the way the middle classes could put forth their political and cultural power. Next slide. And so where did they get all these goods? They went to the new department stores that began to pop up in the 1840s, but by the 1880s, 1890s, they become these huge department stores with an array of goods in them. And here is a postcard from the Beaumarche in Paris. Uh, next slide. Um, one of the things about these uh, department stores is their interiors. Their interiors were made out of steel and that allowed them to open up the space and use a lot of skylights and let the light in. And then they had these beautiful chandeliers. You can see in this slide, this very elaborate staircase, elaborate railings. And they were, these department stores were just fantasy lands that uh, induced people to buy things. Uh, and they were really kind of seductive in that way. Next slide. 
And so with the cult of domesticity, women began to be the main shoppers for their homes. And this was this marked a change. Prior to the 19th century, men, husbands per, uh, purchased most of the goods. Now women went to these department stores unattended, you know, they were not chaperoned, and they purchased the goods, as you can see here in the oriental carpet section of Le Bon Marché. Next slide. And so there the women are out unchaperoned on and shopping. Next slide. So a lot of the advertising is aimed at women and explicitly trying to use this cult of domesticity to get women to buy things and to give them an ideal of what they should try to live up to. And here you see an advertisement for a kind of a beef stock. And you see this woman, she's supposed to be the middle class woman. She's very well dressed in, in household dress. Um, she's not sweating, her hair is in perfect order, her clothes don't have a single spot on it from cooking, and look at all the cooking that she's supposed to be doing. So uh, this is not real. Um, this is fic a fiction, an ideal that they're trying to tell women to live up to. Next slide. And this is um, an advertisement for this herbal skin soap, and why I like this image is because it really conveys to women what they are supposed to look like. Their skin is supposed to be lily white and pure and, this, and the soap allegedly does that for them. But look at all of what she's wearing. You know, she has a corset, she has a tight fitted dress that has a lot of lace, probably very extravagant fabric. Um, she has on a fur cape, she has on kind of a large showy hat. And in my view, she looks like a doll. Okay, um, it's hard to do work, manage the household, manage your servants, manage your children if you're dressed like that. So women are getting mixed messages. This is how you're supposed to look, um, but yeah, they're supposed to carry on a lot of activities. Next slide. So the cult of do domesticity hinged on reproduction. Women were to have children. Motherhood above all was lauded. That was their main role. And in the case of Britain, they had a perfect model, Queen Victoria. Uh, she ruled from 1837 until her death in 1901. At 18 years old in 1837, she became the queen and that ushered in what we call the Victorian era, again, till her death in 1901. So she's really, I mean, in some ways, the most powerful ruler in all of the world. Um, and she's a very prudent ruler. Uh, her reign symbolized virtue and service to the nation. And certainly as she ruled, England enjoyed a, an era of absolute splendor. This is when industrialization takes off and um, as sea trade is very vibrant and England benefits tremendously. And one of the ways that you can measure that is all of the goods that end up in English homes. So they have parlors filled with chairs and needlework tables and uh, all kinds of furniture with you know, precious stones in them and fancy woods from all over the world. Next slide. So Victoria becomes an icon. Queen Victoria becomes an icon and they use her in advertising. They use her over and over again for so many different things. So here, for example, she's used to, her image is used to sell Cadbury's cocoa and um, she's in a train. You can see Windsor Castle in the background. She's with one of her daughters and they're sort of, they're conveying that you can go on a journey, something exotic and you can have cocoa. Next slide. Here you see Queen Victoria. She's in the center there in 1881 with her family. She had nine children. She was married to Prince Albert of saxe coburg gotha He was German. Um, by all accounts, they had a, a happy marriage. Um, it was a model of stability, a model of familial love and fidelity. Uh, she gave the impression publicly that she was a very devoted ruler, a very devoted wife, and a very devoted mother. Some suggest that she was disappointed that she had so many children so early, but at the bottom line is she becomes the role model, not only for women in England, but women across um, the Western world. So Victoria, um, 
was believed to have loved her husband. Um, and she becomes kind of the model of the idea of a new sort of relationship between men and women in the course of the 19th century. So in the 19th century, particularly among the middle classes in the Western world, the idea of companionship, the idea of uh, having a spouse changes pretty significantly. And you have the birth of love and romance in the institution of marriage. So increasingly, marriage was based on mutual affection and emotion. And increasingly, um, the couple had a say in who they were going to marry. Now, this doesn't mean that ec economic partnerships went away. Uh, certainly, families sought to secure their finances through marriage. Uh, but ec economic matters um, became less important. Social class continued to be important. Um, you usually married within your class. Uh, but the goal for most women, particularly middle-class women, was to get married. And she had to spend her life preparing for the perfect marriage to be the perfect wife. Women, um, basically, when they hit the age about 18 years old, their childhood was over. Okay, Sometimes it was younger, but usually it was around 18. And that's when she made her entrance into society. So they didn't really have a concept of being a teenager. Instead, you went from childhood right away to being an adult woman. Uh, and women usually in England, for example, they married from, uh, from 23 to 26 was the average time. And how you know, how you knew that a woman was ready for a marriage is the first thing she did is she put up her hair. Okay. So young girls, they had their hair down, uh, women signaling that they are ready for a husband. They put their hair up and they also lengthen their skirt. And from that point on, it would be very rare to see a woman with her hair down. And so all of this emphasis on getting married, particularly for the middle classes. And so you can imagine young women in the middle classes, they were very much preoccupied with ideas of marriage and romance throughout most of their life. And they spent their time preparing to, uh, to be a wife. And so the inevitable outcome for them was marriage. And they hoped that this marriage would be based on love and affection. Next slide. So in the course of the 19th century, they developed a host of elaborate courting rituals. And they kind of looked back to history and they thought, well, when was a time when love was uh, took off? And they looked back to medieval courtly love. So what I want to say is this is not exactly real. What you have is a 19th century fantasy about what courtly love was like in the medieval period. And so courtly love emerged at uh, the end of the 11th century, and um, it was based on a code of chivalry among the noble classes. It began in France and was transported to England, and um, it was seen as something as pure love. Now, you understand that for the noble classes throughout most of history, marriage was not based on love. love or marriage was used to secure dynastic uh, ambitions. And so the noble classes married among the noble classes and oftentimes uh, children who would become kings and queens, they were uh, betrothed even when they were quite young as their parents made an alliance with another powerful um, leader. And so if that was the arrangement, then love was not expected within marriage. Love happened outside of marriage. And so uh, they were married, but they usually had lovers. And with this courtly love and this code of chivalry, great emphasis was placed on the rituals for love. So male suitors had lots to do to woo their ladies. They had to prove their love through a gauntlet of tests. They had to make brave deeds. For example, they had to be the champion jousters. They had to be able to write poetry. They had to be able to sing troubadour songs or at least hire some troubadours to go serenade their love. And they also exchanged tokens, jewelries, such as rings. And so when the 19, we get to the 19th century, the middle classes look back at courtly love and say, this was the pure love. And they try to replicate that um, in the 19th century. Next slide. 
So, as I said, a host of rituals develop um, to sort of promote this kind of romantic love in the 19th century. Uh, and at the center of this are debutante balls. So debuté is a French word. Um, it means to lead off. And so it's basically young women, the beginners from the noble classes announcing that they are ready for marriage. And so there's a whole series of balls and other events that take place whereby marriageable young women basically tell society that they're looking for a husband. So this happened when women reached the age of maturity. Usually, again, it's about 18. Sometimes it could be as young as 15 years old. Now, in order to qualify to be a debutante, uh, first you had to be of the aristocracy, and then increasingly in the course of the century, you could be from the middle classes, and you had to demonstrate a quality education. You had to speak several languages. You had to play the piano, be able to sing. You had to be able to paint in watercolors and oils. You had to be able to do needlepoint. Um, in the cases of France and, uh, and, and England, you had to memorize the members of the monarchy. And you had to learn classical history and geography. You also had to demonstrate that you would be an excellent hostess. You had to be poised. You had to be beautiful. And you had to be ready to have as many children as possible. Well, maybe the number one thing for the upper middle classes is, and, and the aristocracy, to get married, a woman had to have a dowry, um, a sum of money and maybe some other goods and houses and whatnot that the future husband would get in exchange for the marriage. Now, um, so you have these debutantes who go out in the social season, the debutante season, and um, they meet men. Now, men also had some qualifications. Above all, they had to demonstrate that they could take care of a new wife and the family in the, uh, to the custom that she is expecting. And so usually they had to have one year of income on their hands. And then uh, what they would have to do is once they got married, they spent about 50% of it on the household. They also had to have sufficient funds to employ at least three servants. And so they had to save quite a few years. And this postponed marriage for young men in England, for example, um, most men married about 25 to 30 years old. Next slide. Uh, next slide. Next, there, there we go. Okay, so the debutante season began with elaborate debutante balls. In many countries, they happened, the first ball happened at the court. So this was the aristocracy of Europe uh, meeting each other um, and arranging marriages. So a lot of these er the nobility, they lived in the countryside. They came to the cities uh, where the monarchs resided and they uh, participated in these balls. And these balls could be very large and lavish with as many 3,000 people in attendance. And what you see in this image here is uh, this parade that has to happen. So the first ball is at the court with the monarch and all of the young women have to go in front of the monarch and bow before him or her. So in this case, you can see these young debutantes. Um, there's one bowing right in front of uh, Queen Victoria. So that's how the ball opened. And these young women were always attended by an older woman, and usually it was their mother. So the mother in this cult of domesticity, it culminated in presenting their daughters at the debutante balls. The young girls, um, young women, they were dressed in gowns that resembled wedding gowns. Uh, a lot of times they wore white in France for exclusive. France, for example, they exclusively wore white. Sometimes they wore gowns and other pale colors. They usually wore very long white gloves and they carried bouquets. There was a season for this. It varied from, from country to country. In London, for example, the debutante season was a spring through June or July. And um, these very elaborate balls continued for quite a long time. 
uh, for England, the, they were suspended during World War I and World War II, but they lasted until 1957. In 1958, Queen Elizabeth, the Queen today, she did away with these ceremonies. Next slide. So at the ball, the mother of the debutante uh, monitored the interactions, excuse me. She kept a very close eye on the young men who were interested in her daughter. Uh, most of the ball consisted of dancing and these young women <coughs> and young men danced together. And if they kind of had a flame sort of coming out, uh, it, were, it was very much frowned upon if they sat out and kind of made eyes at each other. The young men and women were to dance with as many partners as possible um, at these balls. So once the grand ball took place, then there were lots of other social events. So families hosted balls. Um, in a single season, a woman could tend up to 50 balls, 60 parties, 30 dinners, and 25 breakfasts. Uh, so uh, lots of opportunities to meet, for young couples to meet. And the goal was to find a spouse by the end of the season. If successful, they married maybe even that same year, uh, or at least they had a fiance lined up. You could be a debutante for two or three seasons. If you didn't find a husband by then, uh, you were kind of put out to pasture and labeled a spinster, and um, it was definitely deemed a failure in the 19th century. Um, all the young men that participated in these debutante rituals were very carefully inspected by the girl's family. So meetings didn't happen by chance. They were very uh, well arranged and, and concocted. And uh, daughters were expected to be good political, good hostesses. Um, and uh, they were expected to sort of meet these men that their families preferred. So in the course of the 19th century, then you have the middle classes they obviously increase their wealth tremendously and they begin to participate in the debutante season as well. And, and frankly, a lot of the aristocracy begin, interest, begin to become interested in the uh, middle classes because the middle classes sometimes have more money in the 19th century than the uh, aristocracy. So the aristocracy is marrying into the middle classes in order to secure their financial prospects. Next slide. Now, while all this elaborate courting rituals are going on among the aristocracy and the middle classes, it's important to point out that there are also courting rituals going on in the countryside. And these have a long, long history. Essentially, uh, young men and women on the countryside had a lot more freedom to pursue love than the noble classes and the middle classes. And these young peasant couples, would they would meet at fairs and markets and festivals. They usually married someone from their own village. Um, there was a courtship. Uh, the young men tried to woo the women with food and money and clothes. Uh, uh, by the time you get to the 19th century, the and the countryside, the peasants are copying some of what is going on in the cities with the aristocracy and the middle classes, and they're having uh, coming out balls. I mean, they're much, much smaller. They're kind of more like country dances, um, but they're participating in this as well. Next slide. So after the debutante balls take place, then it's possible for young men to court a young woman. He would go and call on her, um, and he would leave his card. Uh, in the 19th century, it's very popular to have cards made up that provided your information. You would go a calling and sometimes you would meet with them or sometimes you would just leave your card. So he would leave his card. He might have dinner with her family and there could be a courting going on for months or even years. Uh, and at the same time, there still are matchmakers trying to sort of make the magic happen. And that's the family's trying to make sure that the spouse whom the young man or woman choose is appropriate for the family. Next slide. So women had to be very, very careful and they had to recognize that 
just the slightest attention that they gave to a man could be read as an indication that they wanted to marry them. Uh, and so here you see uh, a young girl, she's gotten a love letter and it looks like uh, she's uh, found herself her beau. Next slide. In this case, um, in this one, you see the woman has received a bracelet. And so she's accepting a bracelet. It's probably pretty certain that the man who gave it to her is going to be her future husband. Next slide. So after the courting takes place, then you get to the moment where the young man wants to make a proposal of marriage. And he certainly had to ask the girl's father for permission to marry. And once again, you have very elaborate rituals associated with this. A series of meetings where the men and the women's behavior were very much prescribed. What they wore was very prescribed. And meanwhile, the family is mediating everything. Once the father agreed that they could be engaged, then um, the man, the future groom, he had to make a request in writing. And then when that was accepted, then he could begin to visit his, um, his fiance. But once again, lots and lots of rules associated with how they were to interact. An engagement usually lasted about six months, um, uh, but it could be as short as three months and it could go over a year. And the engagement time was the time when this couple got to know each other. So they didn't really know each other well before the engagement. And now they had to spend some time to get to know each other. Again, lots of rules um, about how they could interact. Um, and they definitely were chaperoned. Fiancés, the male, the grooms, they had lots of responsibilities. If they were wealthy enough, they were to send their loved one flowers every single day of their engagement. By the time you get to the 1840s, engagement rings became very popular. Uh, the bride during the engagement, she had to prepare her trousseau. And all of this, once again, was um, prescribed by conduct books. So we have a mass of conduct books coming out to tell young women how to be engaged and what they are supposed to do and what they are, uh, how they are to look and how they're supposed to handle this period of their life. And the one message from all of these books is they are supposed, the, the young women are supposed to sort of make themselves appear to be elusive and angelic like so that the future husband would idealize them. Next slide. Um, if the courting rituals weren't enough, you had a uh, consumption to help you along, and that's uh, the birth of the Valentine's Day. So Valentine's Day steps in to help those seeking romance, love, and marriage in the 19th century. Now, Valentine's Day has um, origins, various origins. They're very obscure. Um, and Today, what we inherited as Valentine's Day really came from the 19th century. Next slide. We do believe that um, Valentine's Day, some of its origins um, are in ancient Rome. In ancient Rome, they had a festival on February 15th that basically was a festival to fertility. Um, and on that day, what would happen is um, young men would uh, have names of the girls in the village and they would pick their names out of a lottery and that's the person that they were to be paired with for at least next year and often these uh, pairings ended in marriage. Next slide. Valentine's Day was held by someone called Saint Valentine. Now we don't really know exactly the history because there were a number of Saint Valentines, at least a dozen, there was even a pope named Valentine, so we're not even sure exactly which Valentine this refers to, um, but there's lots of legends associated with St. Valentine. So one, for example, is St. Valentine was a priest who lived during the third century, and um, he um, was ruled, and he was in Rome, and he was ruled over by Emperor Claudius II, and Claudius II was upset because the young men were getting married, and he thought that they should be soldiers, and so he wanted to ban young men young men from getting married. And apparently St. Valentine 
intervene and he performed marriages of these young lovers against the emperor's wishes. And because of that, allegedly the emperor Claudius put him to death. So that's just sort of one legend. There are other legends associated that we don't really know, but uh, all of these legends kind of have St. Valentine as this emissary who makes love happen. By the time we get to the 14th century, um, there is a cult of St. Valentine, and he is recognized as the saint of love. I should say um, he became a saint officially in 489, um, but then in 1969, the Catholic Church kind of decommissioned him um, from recognized saints. Next slide. So in the Middle Ages, there were also lots of sort of folklore, popular cultural practices associated with Valentine's Day. Uh, there, what one of, the, one of the things that they believed was February 14th was the day that birds found their mates for the seasons. But in many ways, what, how, what we think of Valentine's Day is uh, sort of a poetic invention. And here Chaucer played a prominent role um, he wrote a poem in 1375 called Parliament of Fool, and in that St. Valentine was mentioned, and um, he linked it to birds and springtimes and lovers and matchmaking, and that's kind of what we see as the beginning of a modern uh, St. Valentine's Day. In the 15th to the 18th centuries, Valentine's Day takes off. It's filled with courtly love rituals. It also has its folk roots and fortune telling and drinking. Um, small tokens are exchanged. It could be letters or handmade gifts. If you're wealthier, you might exchange jewelry. Next slide. Um, by the time we get to the 18th century, uh, they were exchanging uh, small tokens. And here what you have is a uh, card, a handmade card. It's French made at the end of the 18th century. And you can see that uh, people are beginning to show their love with these handmade cards and notes that they are writing to each other. Next slide. Um, some of these Valentines, early Valentines, were quite elaborate. So one of them is, is what they call a puzzle purse. You might have seen this. Um, th this is on these illustrations are unfolded. You see the outside and the inside in these two pictures. But what it would have come as, as, as a box, and the person receiving the Valentine would um, open up the squares in a certain order. There was a strict order how you did it, and then it would be a declaration of love. Next slide. This one I'm, I'm really curious about. Uh, I think it is all handmade, and you can see there is embroidery in it. Um, Forget me not, that was the flower uh, of Valentine's Day. And you can see this lace, which I think is handmade, and it looks like this is also jewel studded or has some kinds of stones um, inlaid into this lace. And so you begin to see that the Valentines become more and more elaborate. Next slide. But eventually, uh, capitalism takes over and industrialization produce, produces uh, ready-made Valentines. So by the time we get to the 1840s in Western Europe and in the United States, uh, purchasing and sending ready-made Valentine's Day card was a very popular uh, popular ritual for lots of people. So it becomes a commercial holiday. Next slide. Uh, before the cards take off, uh, what's really popular are verse books. So these are verse books with decorations of love, and they're intended for young men who, you know, might have trouble expressing their love. So here's one, a verse, an example. Valentine's, Valentine's, come ye lovers one and all, be ye great or be ye small, into grams make a dash, there can be no better place to spend your cash. Every lover will find Valentine's to suit his mind. From high to low, his prices range to suit the quality of change, which in your pocket so loosely jingles to Graham's ears so sweetly tingles. So if you can't make your Valentine, if you can't write your own verse, you can go buy something. So Valentine's Day cards take off like in, in a very massive way. 
in the mid 20s, for example, in England, about 200,000 cards circulated. By the time we get to uh, 1870, um, they're delivering as many as 1 million Valentine's Day cards in England. And part of, part of the success story here is not only the mass production of the cards, but also the fact that postage rates uh, plummet and it becomes very affordable to send Valentines. Next slide. So I think it's fair enough to say that Valentine's Day and this notion of love was driven by commercialization and consumption. And there was lots of new rituals associated with this. This, these cards, you know, they were sent to lovers. They were sent anonymously. And that was sort of part of the thrill for everybody trying to guess who sent the card um, or decoration of love. But eventually then they also began to, they send them to their friends and family. So uh, something that very much took off by, uh, you know, 1860 or so. Next slide. And then the iconography of, of Valentine's Day, Cupid is central. So Cupid appears in lots and lots of these cards. It's a naked cherub who launches arrows at unsuspecting lovers. And so here we're getting back to the uh, uh, popular folk roots of Valentine's Day, that there's this magical intervention that happens through Cupid. He makes people fall in love. Next slide. Um, and so in this illustration, what you see is uh, it looks like a young woman is receiving a valentine. And again, it's just to illustrate the fact that it's with the reduction in postal costs um, that allow these valentines to be mailed um, in large, large quantities. Next slide. So um, here is a quotation from Charles, Charles Lamb. Uh, from 1835 describing receiving a Valentine Day card. The Valentine was radiant, all gold and gay colors, red and yellow and blue, and embossed and glittering with devices, all of love. It was like a dream so fine, I had never seen anything like it. I was satisfied, delighted. What is the word? Enchanted. Here's another, next slide. Um, here's another, uh, example of a woman receiving um, a Valentine's Day card. And in this case, she's describing her daughter, Mary, receiving a Valentine's Day card. I cannot tell you how delighted Mary was with the Valentine. She jumped about and up and down an expression of joy. She has shown it to her school teacher and many other friends. It is a beautiful thing and she sends you many thanks for it. Next slide. But not everybody was really like happy with these Valentine's Day and certainly some of the postal workers who felt overwhelmed around February 14th and were not exactly satisfied. And here you see a note from an inspector um, to his boss. Here's what he said. Amongst many customs, useful and ridiculous, which have been handed down to us from our ancestors, I lately observed one of drawing Valentine's on the evening preceding Valentine's Day, which was much in this manner. The boys collected all the names of females, unmarried, they could remember, and wrote them separately upon little tickets or big paper, which were put into a hat and shaked about for some time, when each of them drew one of these out, and the next day sent a kind of poetical epistle to the girl who was his Valentine or lot. I confess the meaning of this is extremely strange to me at present, as I cannot see anything in it useful or entertaining. I should therefore be greatly obliged if any correspondent of yours would favor me with a reason for this superstitious ceremony. So here he's describing those old folk roots whereby young men put the names in a hat, drew out a girl's name, and that became his object of affection for the next months. Next slide. Well, if all of these courting rituals worked properly, the woman got married. And definitely for most women, as they sort of came up as a teenager, their wedding day would be the most important day of their life. Next slide. And once again, they had a model, and that was Queen Victoria, who got married in 1840. Um, and so she's idealized. And her uh, relationship with her husband, Prince Albert, is idealized. And many people believe she married 
for love and affection and they had a happy marriage. Um, can you put the slide back up? And that uh, this idea is encapsulated in this quotation. The queen is fortunate enough to wed the prince of her own voluntary choice, the man of her unprompted affections. And so in people's mind, she embodied this new idea of marriage based on companionship and mutual affection. So in the course of the 19th century, as they're writing all these manuals of domesticity, they're also writing manuals of uh, courting rituals and marriage rituals as well. Uh, next slide. They're helped along by popular culture here. For example, you see uh, the um, uh, sheet music for today I've made sweet Annie Rooney my wife. Uh, and so this is what the girls are singing at the piano. Next slide. And so on the wedding day, the bride had a performative function. And what I mean by that is she had to play a role. Uh, here you see, um, here, here's a quotation from another advice book. This is French. Here's what they're saying to the bride. Make sure that later, whatever circumstances and perhaps disillusionments may arise, the husband will always retain the memory of a slender, white form and a pure gaze the sign of a truly innocent soul. So on that day, that most important day for young girls is they are to uh, be, uh, make themselves look perfect. And so bridal dress became very important. Previously, lots of young women wore dresses that were green because green was a sign of fertility. But once Queen Victoria put on a white dress at her wedding, uh, white dresses became the norm. And as the 19th century goes on, they become more and more elaborate, filled with bay, uh, bay, uh, lace, um, much more expensive uh, materials such as uh, silks and linens. Uh, the brides also had lots of accessories, white gloves, embroidered silk stockings. Um, and then if they were lucky, they were jewelry, usually diamonds and pearls, and these were gifts from their husbands. Next slide. In this photograph, you see a bride and a groom, and note that the, the groom also has some things that he has to wear. Uh, they began um, in the early 19th century with frock coats, but they were replaced with waistcoats and lavender trousers, and they generally wore a top hat. Next picture. Um, and in these rituals, they became more and more elaborate. So, for example, uh, before the 19th century, it was very typical for the couple to have one bridegroom and one bridesmaid, and their job was basically at the church, they were to collect money from the attendees to give to the church. But in the 19th century, they began to have large bridesmaids party, and here, as you see, one, well, this is from King George V, so obviously that's sort of the most elaborate of all. But you had a whole host of bridesmaids who had these beautiful gowns. Um, and they started out wearing white, but by the end of the 19th century, it was no longer fashionable for the bridesmaids to wear white because they weren't supposed to compete with the bride herself. At, next slide. After the ceremony, there was some kind of celebration. They usually began with, you know, sort of relatively modest breakfasts, often at the homes of the bride. But as the century wore on, uh, these celebrations became more and more elaborate. Um, they might have been pushed back to be luncheons instead of breakfasts. And then at the, by the end of the 19th century, they changed the laws and allowed the, um, allowed the couple to marry later in the day. And as a result... The celebrations got pushed back, they became dinners, and sometimes they even had dancing. Next slide. Um, here is a photograph of uh, Buckingham, or Buckingham Palace, and this is King George's um, his, his reception before anybody's arrived. But what I want to point out to you here is what's in front here, which is the wedding cake. The beginning of the 19th century, wedding cakes were pretty simple and modest. Queen Victoria had, had a one-story wedding cake. It was large. Um, it was a large plum cake, but it was just sort of very simple. In the course of the 19th century, um, these wedding cakes became more and more elaborate, and they became these towering structures uh, made of sugar and confectionery. Next slide. So if 
the you might know remember the king and the queen of england they have nine children so there's lots and lots of weddings happening by you know the 1850s 60s of their children getting married and then their children's um weddings are very are much very much put into the public eye through the media and then what they're doing the middle classes want to emulate so if they're having elaborate cakes so too do the middle classes want elaborate cakes and there here you see an advertisement for a cake next slide now the bride was supposed to guard her chastity above all if there's one thing a girl had and she had a guarantee on her wedding day is that her father turned over a virgin and so lots of stress was put on young girls to remain virgins and definitely the conduct books that the girls were reading basically told them how to be virtuous. Next slide. So here's just some examples. This is from the Fable of Bees, 1714. A young lady of refined education keeps a strict guard over her looks as well as her actions. And in her eyes, we may read a consciousness that she has a treasure about her, not out of danger of being lost, and which she is resolved not to part with in any terms. Next slide. Here's another um, example of this. A double temptation of vanity and desire is so prevalent in our male sex that we are apt to interpret every obliging look, gesture, smiles, or sentence of a female we like to the hopeful side. In other words, just the simplest kind of indication might make a man think that uh, he, uh, he has seduced this young woman. Next slide. And so women were to guard their sexuality, guard their virginity. But the problem was the sexuality was clouded in secrecy. So just at the moments it became more important, women and girls didn't know much about sex. And this is embodied above all in the idea of a stork. So who brought the baby a stork because they didn't want to talk about sex. And, you know, it's a bit of an irony because in the course of the 19th century, um, the biological sciences make huge inroads. We discover a lot, but just at that time when we're learning more about biology, sexuality is clouded in secrecy. And so it's kind of an irony. They use these new biological medical sciences only to reinforce women's subordination. So for example, things like menstruation were seen as a dangerous sort of period, a time in, sort of in, in a woman's sort of life cycle. Childbirth, in many people's views, was evidence that women was a frailer, well, of the frailer sex, which clearly that wasn't written by anybody who had a child. <laughs> um, and so uh, women uh, just really didn't know much about sexuality at all as they entered this marriage. Next slide. And so there, were there was danger lurking everywhere and young girls and women had to be on alert to keep their virginity. Next slide. And so I'm going to conclude with this quotation. Um, it's from the play by Frank Vatican um, called Spring Awaken in 1891. And Venla is a young girl, um, and her mother's talking to her in this quotation. And her mother's telling her about her sister who just had a baby. And here's what she said. You'll never guess, Venla, last night the stork was with your sister and brought her a little boy. That's what happens when you live so close to the stork. It's only two years since she walked up the aisle in her wedding dress. So Vendela, a young teenager, learns that the stork, if you live close to the stork, brings a baby. And of course, in this play, um, Vendela is going to have a very hard time and she's going to become pregnant because she doesn't understand how people have children. And uh, she thinks that the stork brings her, springs them. Okay, so I guess we will stop there today. Um, and I hope you enjoyed today's lecture. I hope you learned something. I hope you learned something fun, something you can relate to. And again, if you have any questions or comments or just want to drop me a line, I would love to hear from you. Again, my email address is s-s-e-w-e-l-l -L at vw.edu. You have a great week. And next week, we're going to talk about women's fashions. Take care.